Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the launch of the uh, new Bipartisan Policy Center's Housing Commission. It's terrific to see uh, all of you here. Also great to have our friends, uh, Senators Dominici and Lott, joining us. Um, launching a major new initiative uh, for us is always a combination of uh, exhilaration and fear. Um, you know, we approach the challenge um, with a very high aspiration to chart a detailed and politically viable direction forward for national housing policy. At the same time, we do recognize that this field is complex, contentious, and I think fair to say in crisis. Moreover, the government that we seek to influence is deeply polarized, and the institutions and traditions that we have relied on for decades to solve these kinds of problems are clearly under tremendous strain. These are not conditions that are unique to housing policy. In fact, at the Bipartisan Policy Center, we see them as the basic boundary conditions that organize about all the work we do. When Senator Mitchell and his colleagues, Bob Dole, Howard Baker, and Tom Daschle, formed this organization, it was not because they imagined that the issues we would take on would be easy, but rather because of their fundamental faith in the ability to solve hard problems within a two-party democracy that is aided by substantive debate. As you will see shortly, uh, by the co-chairs leading this effort, we do not aspire to nonpartisanship here. We are pro-labels. We embrace constructive partisanship and the productive collision of ideas. While every one of our projects has its despairing moments, our basic vision and approach has been vindicated by the collaborative work of proud Democrats and proud Republicans on projects like the debt, on energy, a number of national security issues ranging from U.S. posture towards Russia to Egypt to Iran. Finally, we recognize that being smart um, is necessary, but by no means sufficient to actually having a meaningful impact on government. That's why we are committed, hopefully, to working with many of you, as well as local, state, and national leaders around the country. And it's also why we are bringing together a diverse group of 18 commissioners who have agreed to spend as me at least as much time advocating for any shared solutions as they spend developing them. And the full group of commissioners uh, will be uh, recruited and announced before our first full meeting, which will be in early December. So in closing, I um, really need to express tremendous gratitude to the MacArthur Foundation and their president, Bob Gallucci, who is here with us today. Um, many of you know that MacArthur's substantive leadership in this field and the confidence to explore a diverse array of ideas and different approaches has really set the bar for philanthropy in housing and in many other fields, and we truly appreciate this partnership. In closing, it is my pleasure to announce Julie Stash, who is the VP of MacArthur's United States Programs. She's responsible for all U.S. grant making. She has served in a host of national and local government positions, including a tour of duty as the number two at the uh, General Services Administration as well as being both Housing Commissioner and Chief of Staff for Chicago Mayor Richard M. Daley. Prior to these public roles, Julie was a leading real estate developer, as well as Head of Operations for the nation's first community development bank in Chicago. So as many of you know, Julie knows a little bit about housing policy, and that has really embellished the partnership that we've begun. If you please join me in welcoming Julie Stash. Well, thank you, Jason, and thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center for being willing to take on the challenge of developing a consensus plan to address one of the foundational issues for our economy and actually in the life of virtually every American citizen. Now, we all know that the housing market weakness is stifling recovery from the recession. The financing and the delivery systems are broken, but this is all happening at the same time that research is reinforcing the important role that stable housing plays in how young people do in school, in keeping a job, in physical and mental health, and a host of other outcomes. But at the same time, it's just not clear who's thinking about what kind of housing the next generation will need. Our society is changing ethnically and culturally. It's aging. Family structure is changing. Steady income is less certain. What kind of housing will we need? How should it be designed, financed, and delivered? And how should the housing stock that this country has already invested in be renewed for a new generation of renters and owners? How should we think about housing and its relationship to transportation, to the environment, to health, and of course, 
What role should the federal government play in all of this? By next year, the MacArthur Foundation will have invested more than $300 million in housing practice and policy. So we care about all of this. But what we care most about right now is that smart, pragmatic, and influential people take this issue on and wrestle it to the ground. It's too important for it to be the victim of sharp ideological rhetoric and short-sighted perspective. That's why the Bipartisan Policy Center is just the right place, and the individuals that you'll hear from today are just the right people, to undertake a thoughtful, reasoned examination and produce a policy blueprint that will resonate with our political and our policy leaders. The MacArthur Foundation is not seeking a particular policy outcome, but what we are seeking is a process that will consider the facts, examine the evidence, and recommend and advocate for a set of smart policies that address the issue head on and help prepare this country for the future. Now that process is the Bipartisan Policy Center's process, and that's why we're pleased to support it. So thanks, first of all, from me to our CEO, Robert Gallucci, but thank you, Senator Mitchell, Senator Bond, Senator Martinez, and Secretary Cisneros for being willing to lead this effort. I want to thank in advance the other commissioners who will join you, but also thank all the people who care about this issue and whose diverse views will inform your thinking. We look forward to a consensus product that will shape the future. Thank you very much. And it is now my uh, real pleasure to uh, introduce one of my colleagues who will be doing most of the work over the next uh, couple of years. Pam hughes Patnout is well known uh, to the Housers in the room. That's, that's a new term for me, Hauser. I don't truly like it, but I'm told it's real. Um, <laughs> Pam has spent nearly 30 years in this field with positions at the local, state, and national level. She served as the Assistant Secretary at HUD for Community Planning and Development where she, in the George W. Bush administration where she administered over $8 billion uh, in housing and community development programs. She's also spent time uh, in the home building industry, and most recently she began the Terwilliger Housing Center at the Urban Land Institute. Finally, most importantly, she's a really lovely person who needs very little sleep, so she is perfect <laughs> for the years that will follow. Pam. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many of my friends from both sides of the aisle. Uh, I won't refer to them as Housers, since my boss doesn't like that word. Uh, but truly, this is a wonderful representation of the housing industry. And I'd also like to welcome you to my new home. I'm thrilled to be part of the BPC. Just want to take a minute and recognize the collective contributions of the folks in this room. I see people that I've known for more than 30 years and the commitment that you've made to the American people to provide affordable housing. Earlier this year, when I was asked to help orchestrate the work of the commission, I was captured by the pioneering spirit of this young organization and the leadership's embrace of optimistic goals. That's an understatement, optimistic goals, when we're talking about Jason. I'm excited to take part in this promising initiative and look forward to working with many of you as we begin to ramp up our outreach efforts. It's been almost two years since economists declared the end of the Great Recession, at least the end of what is referred to as a textbook recession. Unfortunately, most Americans, the end of the recession is far from over. The gravity of this crisis continues to impede a meaningful recovery. Today, as we begin this challenging assignment to address the root cause of the housing crisis and to build a solid foundation in order to meet the nation's future housing needs, we must not lose sight of the fact that the collateral damage is not the rooftops, abandoned buildings, or the bricks and mortar, but these are the people, the men, women, and children who are members of every generation, who are the victims of the seemingly endless downturn. They are the millions of Americans suffering the emotional hardship as a result of a foreclosure pandemic, loss of jobs, and evaporation of life savings. They are the victims of well-intentioned but misguided public policies that led our country to a near economic collapse. 
For too long, this country has witnessed a significant disconnect between the acute housing needs in this nation and thus far has inadequately addressed them. The financial meltdown and its reverberating aftermath have signaled an imperative. We must change course with the policies that impact the housing. Today, under the leadership and guidance of these great statesmen, and in the spirit of bipartisanship, the Housing Commission will begin a year-long process to challenge old assumptions and conventional thinking. It will examine, re-examine outdated measures of success in search of radical solutions and a strategic realignment of our national housing policy. As great leaders, they know that only the right action at the right time will bring success. Now is the right time. America can no longer hit the pause button. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guests here with me today. For more than four decades, Henry Cisneros has dedicated his life to building stronger communities. During his four years as term of mayor of San Antonio, Henry gained national recognition for his leadership that led to the economic renaissance of one of America's truly great cities. During his tenure at HUD, Secretary Cisneros championed the enforcement of our nation's fair housing laws. As a tireless advocate of civil rights, he continued to carry the torch. Together with his good friend, Jack Kemp, he co-chaired the National Commission on Fair Housing to commemorate the 40th anniversary of our nation's Fair Housing Act. In an effort to push housing higher on the national agenda, Henry Cisneros and Jack Kemp joined forces once again as co-authors, publishing an award-winning book, Opportunity and Progress, a bipartisan platform for national housing policy. With the support of his Capitol Hill colleague and friend, Senator Kit Bond, Henry successfully implemented the HOPE 6 program, replacing public housing in America with the development of vibrant mixed-use, mixed-income communities. As a longtime member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, including serving as chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee responsible for funding HUD programs, Senator Bond played a leading role in shaping federal housing policy and programs for more than two decades. During his time in the Senate, Kit Bond was a prominent advocate for veterans and the chronically homeless. He was instrumental in making homeless prevention a key federal priority. Prior to his retirement from the U.S. Senate, Kit Bond was instrumental in crafting key legislation that was included in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. Senator Bond's swift action helped to ensure the continued functioning of the Low Income Housing Tax Pro Program during the liquidity crisis. Secretary Mel Martinez served as our nation's 12th HUD Secretary. I had the great honor to serve under Secretary Martinez, as many of you that are gathered here today also. Shortly after his arrival at HUD, Mel Martinez was warned by the department's career leadership not to engage in RESPA reform. Needless to say, <laughs> Mel Martinez was not deterred by their ominous warnings to stay clear of the third rail. Secretary Martinez was deeply concerned about predatory lending practices and was determined to simplify the real estate closing process by creating greater transparency, eliminating unnecessary requirements, and reducing the cost burden for potential home buyers. During the early morning hours of September 11, 2001, Secretary Martinez was actively engaged in a lively debate with housing industry leaders about the future of the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. When he received the word about the unthinkable terrorist attacks, on the World Trade Center. Just nine months into his tenure as HUD Secretary, he would be called upon by President George W. Bush to oversee the rebuilding efforts in Lower Manhattan. Secretary Martinez was also a strong advocate for those most in need. He set an ambitious goal for our nation to work towards ending chronic homelessness. Today, we have seen significant progress thanks to his vision and commitment. Senator George Mitchell, a man of uncommon excellence from the great state of Maine. During his tenure he earned as Senate Majority Leader, he earned enormous bipartisan respect 
for his diplomatic skills and legislative acumen. He is the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our, high, our nation's highest civil, civilian honor, for his peacemaking efforts in Northern Ireland. During his tenure in the United States Senate, he was credited as a key architect of the Tax Reform Act of 1986. This landmark legislation led to the creation of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. To date, this highly acclaimed program has led to the production and preservation of more than two million affordable rental homes. I am confident that with Senator Mitchell's power of persuasion and extraordinary diplomatic skills, the BPC Housing Commission will undoubtedly reach consensus agreements. <laughs> Our moderator for today's discussion served four terms as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Congressman Rick Lazio served as chairman of the House Banking Committee's Subcommittee on Housing and Community Opportunity. He authored and introduced legislation enacting the most sweeping reform of America's public housing. As a member of the House Budget Committee, Congressman, Congressman Lazio helped draft and enact the first balanced budget in decades. Rick remains active today in the Housing Policy Dialogue, serving on the boards of Enterprise Community Partners and the ULI Twilliger Center for Housing. Congressman Lazio is frequently called upon to moderate housing dis discussions about the future of federal housing policy. Please join me in a warm welcome for the extraordinary housing leaders who, who have each left an indelible mark on the housing landscape in America. Our Housing Commission co-chairs, Senator George Mitchell, Senator Kit Bond, Secretary Henry Cisneros, Senator Mel Martinez, and our moderator, Congressman Rick Lazio. Well, thank you, Pam. And I want to thank the audience uh, and, of course, the Bipartisan uh, Policy Center for facilitating this discussion with four of the most distinguished public servants who have been involved in housing. And I have to tell you, as, because three of them are from the Senate side and I'm a House guy, how much pleasure it is for me, on behalf of House members, to be able to ask all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got a, a this, is, this is maybe the most uh, timely of events, given what has happened over the last few days. And we've seen news articles build. And I'm going to begin with, with you, Senator Mitchell. If you look at, at the, uh, uh, the housing situation in America, uh, you've got this negative loop going on between unemployment, which is over 9%, and declining housing prices. Two million homes in America that are vacant. Six million uh, homeowners that, uh, that are seriously uh, delinquent in their mortgage payments. That means they're over 90 days behind on their mortgage payments. Uh, as many as, as one out of every five Americans who have a mortgage uh, are underwater, meaning they owe more in their, their mortgage than their home is worth. In some states uh, like Florida, Santa Martinez, and, and others are even more acutely impacted by this. Why is this, this initiative different in coming up with a solution? Because obviously Congress and the administration to date has not been able to come up and find common ground around GSC reform or a, a sustained policy effort to address this housing overhang. About five years ago, uh, Bob Dole, Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, and I uh, joined with Jason and others in establishing the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, precisely because uh, we believed that uh, there needed to be more bipartisanship in the solution to the major national problems that we face in our society. Uh, and we thought that uh, we were no longer in office, but perhaps we could make a contribution by helping those in office uh, to see that it was possible to fashion meaningful, practical solutions to very difficult problems in a bipartisan way. Uh, and the intervening five years have validated both the concern, which is now, I think, even greater than it was then, and the work of the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, in the area of health care reform, in the area of energy policy, in the area of our national debt and other issues, which Pete Domenici, who's here today, led with Alice Rivlin 
I think the Senate has demonstrated an ability to do what we hoped it could do. And looking now at our national situation, uh, it seemed to us that uh, there's, there are many difficult issues, but none that have a broader impact, both on the overall national economy, of which housing is a crucial part, and on the daily life of virtually every American uh, who needs housing. So uh, our hope is that we can contribute to the national debate and assist those in office by demonstrating that it's possible to come up with a meaningful, practical solution that is deliberately bipartisan in nature. We begin with that premise, that it's possible to reach that agreement. Having said that, I'd like, before you go to the next question, to make correct one thing that Pam said in the introduction. She said I was the author of the low-income housing tax credit. Well, the senators here will know that it's the senators who get the credit for things, but it's the staff who really does things. And it's a fortunate coincidence that the real author of the low-income housing tax credit is sitting here in the audience. His name is Bob Rosen. He was on my staff. I was the front man. He was the key man. He should stand up and be recognized as the author of the low-income housing tax credit. Spoken like a true leader. Senator Martinez. Uh, Senator Mitchell just said in so many words, I think, it's an economic problem and it's a social problem, the housing dilemma that we're facing. Um, is that right? And how do you prioritize this as you think about addressing the pretty daunting issues facing Americans when it comes to housing? Well, it is undoubtedly a human crisis. You know, when you see uh, thousands upon thousands of Americans having lost their homes or in fear of losing their home, uh, that's nothing more fundamental to the structure of a family than that. And so it gets to be emotional, it gets to be personal, and it really touches all of us as Americans because the dream of home ownership and the dream of a, a safe and secure place in which to live and raise a family is fairly much a fundamental principle of, of who we are as a country. So it is undoubtedly that but it's also a huge economic problem. We've talked a little bit already here today about the economic overhang over a recovery created by the housing crisis. And I represent a state that has been as afflicted by this as any, the state of Florida. Uh, I represented a state, I guess I should say. <laughs> I caught myself there. Uh, and you know, the economic recovery will not take place in Florida until we have a housing recovery, until we see that uh, the foreclosures have run its course until we see that there's new employment related to housing, whether it be in construction or it be in, in the financing of it or in the sale and uh, maintenance, upkeep, and so forth. And so I think it's, it's both, and that's why we have to tackle it with a great deal of sensitivity towards the human tragedy that is involved in the current crisis, uh, the need for there to be housing at all levels of the spectrum, from doing something about the homeless issue, which I passionately care about, but to also affordable housing, workforce housing, uh, issues of the role of federal government in housing finance uh, and the proper role that it should have and then beyond all that, how do we get out of the ditch? And uh, so all of that is part of what this commission is about and I look forward to uh, Senator Mitchell's magic about bringing <laughs> despairing points of view together. It's the roadmap. It's all <laughs> about the roadmap. <laughs> Secretary Cisneros, some economists say we're overhoused. Uh, they look at uh, the way the federal government policies sub subsidize housing and they say, uh, some economists anyway will say, of the 290 or so billion dollars in, in subsidies, the vast majority, 230 billion or so, is on the home ownership side. Uh, and as America begins to shift to a maybe a different balance, especially for, since you, when you were secretary between home ownership and rental. What's the optimal policy outlook and, and how do we think about housing, home ownership versus rental? Rick, uh, before I answer, I'd like to take just a point of personal privilege and, and call forth the spirit of a person who was a colleague of yours in the House and a HUD secretary, and that was Jack Kemp, who was the sort of picture of bipartisanship. Um, just as President uh, Kennedy said about uh, Thomas Jefferson, that there was more genius when he dined alone than a gaggle of Nobel Prize winners. Uh, when Jack Kemp sat by himself, there was a bipartisan assembly. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, one of them. <laughs> one of the members of his family is here, and I would like him to thank him uh, to, to rise and be recognized. Uh, one of the Kemp family, Jimmy Kemp. Uh, yeah. um, to answer your question, that's the kind of issue that this commission will take up. Uh, I think its charge, simply stated in one sentence, is to, to look at the, what the shape of housing policy should be going forward. And it's the right time to address that because uh, we're at a point of departure, I think, on housing in the United States, a place we haven't been probably in 40 or 50 years. We've, we had a consensus when President uh, Truman articulated the need in 1949 for a safe and decent home for every American. And we've had modifications to the essential consensus over the years, but we had a seismic event in this crisis, uh, which is more than just a function of the economic cycle. It coincides with new demographics, as Julia mentioned, uh, of, of, of new Americans, uh, of, of an aging population of a wage structure that's changing. So we may not have people who can afford home ownership in the traditional way that they did. Of uh, financial technologies that have changed so dramatically that the regulators can't keep up with the new financial tools. So we are at a point of departure where it's wise to stop and ask the questions. What should the role of government be going forward in housing policy? What is the role of the GSEs? Where are we on this issue of rent versus ownership to sustain the middle class? We know home ownership has been an important part of building the middle class. Are we going to have a stable middle class with home ownership as one of the instruments to get there? So those are the big picture questions, it seems to me, that a commission like this uh, will take on. And uh, there's a lot of hard work to be done. These are not easy questions to answer. But my experience, and I'll close with this, having served on the debt reduction uh, task force here at the Bipartisan Policy Center, that the spirit of bipartisanship, the research that's provided, the consultants made available, uh, the data collected uh, will allow people of goodwill to answer some of those, those questions for the good of the country. Senator Bond, uh, a lot of people say we're not going to be able to, quote, solve the housing problem, reduce the amount of foreclosures. Uh, until more Americans are employed, that, it, that it's the chicken or the egg, which comes first. Other people say we've lost so many jobs in, in housing construction and that housing as a sector has traditionally either driven or been very much a part of leading us out of recession. How do you respond to those people? Which one is it? Is it jobs or is it housing that, that's got to be the priority? Rick, as a, as a former senator, it's, uh, it's good once again to have the chance to enlighten a former House member, uh, just, like, just, just, like, just, like, just like old times. Uh, uh, but let's face it. Senator slapped them a hardest here. <laughs> the American housing system is broken. You just look at, at all the families who are losing their homes uh, and the a tragedy that's, that is the family tragedy. You look at the communities, and I've talked with the leaders in the community who are absolutely frightened by the number of foreclosed homes that are bringing the whole community down. You see what it's done to our economy. Uh, and really, in some ways, I think our flawed uh, housing policy has contributed significantly to the financial problems we have. So we have got to fix uh, this uh, program. That's why it's so, it's so good to be uh, with a group like the uh, Bipartisan Policy Center, which has done an excellent job in bringing together people uh, from both sides of the aisle, all points of view. And when you look at all points of view, uh, there are a myriad of points of view in housing. And trying to bring something together out of that is probably the very best service we could provide, not only to the families, to the communities, uh, but ultimately uh, getting people back to work again and making sure our economy is on a sound path to recovery. So quickly, you mentioned flaws in the system. If you had identified the two or three uh, flaws that you think are most in need of further examination, what would you, what would you say? Oh, I'll be very happy to share my ideas with the commission. Uh, we, have I we have okay. ideas, and, and as has been uh, referred to before, 
uh, everybody has a, comes with a viewpoint. And uh, before we come out with a viewpoint, uh, I think we need to have a serious discussion among the members of the Commission who will represent a broad spectrum uh, of, uh, of knowledge, of information, and interest in housing. So I'll be happy uh, when we get into the opportunity to mix it up to offer my humble ideas. Great, great, great. Thank you. Spoken like a true senator, by the way. <laughs> Uh, Senator Mitchell, we go back to you now. 95% uh, of the mortgage originations are now uh, either guaranteed by the federal government or they end up being mortgages that are owned by the federal government. It's an alphabet soup of FHA and, and Ginny Mae and Fannie and Freddie. And many people talk about the need to, to encourage more private capital to come in and more private sector risk taking. How would you say this commission is going to begin to address some of those issues? First, let me say on the subject of jobs and housing, I don't think one should think of them as sequential or separate. They, they are inextricably linked. Uh, and I don't think you can have a meaningful jobs recovery without uh, uh, improvement in the housing sector, and I think the reverse is true as well. So I think you have to view this in the context of a, of a major national problem, which both are relevant factors. Uh, now, with respect to the question you asked, it is essentially, should there be a government role? What should the government role be? And how can it most effectively achieve the desired result and at the same time attract and involve the private sector? Those are very large philosophical questions. As Kit said, we all have records. Uh, we have votes. We have statements. We have bills. But I think we all, and we all understand and respect that in a country as large and diverse as ours, that's as politically divided as ours, there are different points of view. Uh, uh, I respect the fact that there are many people who don't agree with some of the things I did in housing or other areas, and I don't agree with things that other people did. The whole key is to approach it from an overarching national perspective that gives proper respect to the views of others while keeping alive the possibility of coming up with, and I emphasize this, a practical solution. Anybody can write what in their mind is a perfect bill on housing or anything else. It may be the only, the only person who may think it perfect is the author. And in this country, you have to take into account that people hold different views. And I think it's very, one of the reasons that this is such a good exercise is that we do have different political backgrounds and different views, but if we can sit in a room, and I believe we can come up with a solution that is practical, realistic, and will be helpful to those who have now have the responsibility for enacting our laws. So practical means what to you? Uh, I think something that is capable of being adopted or accepted not guaranteed, but not something that everybody knows from the outset has no chance. You served in the House, we all served in the Senate. We all know that a very substantial number of bills introduced in both houses has no prospect of ever being enacted. And the authors know it at the time they introduce it. But they're done for a variety of reasons. One is to make a political statement. One is to set forth a point of view that will influence the debate, a very legitimate and appropriate way to, to approach things. I, I don't think that's our intention, uh, nor do we have that luxury. I think what we have to do is craft something that, from the outset, is seen as something that is at least capable of being accepted, has the possibility of gaining broad bipartisan support, because you need bipartisan support to get anything done in a system that is as politically divided as ours. So I'm going to shift a little bit now, though this, we could spend the entire hour talking about single family uh, home financing. Let's talk about the, the HUD programs. We've got a lot of experts here in terms of the HUD programs. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure. We have two former secretaries here uh, on the HUD budget, particularly in the Section 8 area. Uh, used to be several years ago that maybe 40% of the budget was 
mandatory related, sort of Section 8. Now it's it's 60 percent and growing, both project-based Section 8 and the voucher programs. So, Senator Martinez, how do you continue to invest in communities? How does HUD play a vibrant leadership role if its budget over time is completely consumed by these mandated costs, and in particular the the, the uh, voucher program? Well, I would say that it cannot. Uh, I remember when I was HUD secretary and uh, my appropriator, Senator Bond, telling me that <laughs> exactly that. He said the HUD, the, the Section 8 budget, it is like a Pac-Man eating at your budget and every year is going to eat more of it. And, and Kit was absolutely right, as he often is, at times is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so I think we have to find a way in which we deal with Section 8 because uh, it, it is a necessary tool to help some of our most distressed families to find a safe and sometimes uh, even a decent place to live. Uh, and so with the constraints on the HUD budget, it cannot be business as usual. We cannot, we cannot continue to just simply uh, do things as we've been because it will consume the HUD budget to a point that HUD won't be able to do other things that it must do. And so I think rethinking Section 8, not to say that we don't have compassion for those that are in Section 8 housing, and we have to find an alternative and an answer, uh, but it has to be a different mechanism for funding, maybe more local input on rent setting. Uh, there's just a whole host of issues around Section 8 that I hope this commission will, will look at and talk about. You know, there, there are so many facets to the housing issue, whether it's a Section 8 problem or it's a public housing problem, where I, I want to give kudos to to Secretary Cisneros and uh, Secretary Kemp uh, for what they did on, on HOPE 6. It's something that I think has been one of the most vibrant programs that, that, that HUD has ever done. And to continue that program and be able to fund it, I think would be an essential tool of creating livable spaces for people. So, you know, the answers are not here today, but it is a problem that must be addressed and it ought to be high on our priority list because uh, without a solution to Section 8 funding, I'm not sure we can have a a viable housing policy at the federal level. And, and, you, and you're starting to see, Secretary Cisneros, really the pressure on that HUD budget, both because of reductions on dis domestic discretionary spending and because of this internal issue of Section 8. And, and the program I identify you with so much, which is this HOPE 6 program, and the President's budget got zeroed out, CDBG coming down, beginning to see the first signs sure. of stress in that budget. Rick, I think Secretary Martinez has spoken correctly to the need to get a handle on the Section 8 issues. Uh, but, 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 there, but beyond that, um, the answer may lie in finding a, a, you know, bigger picture responses that involve more than just the HUD budget. That is to say, there are states, there are localities, there's the private sector, there's foundations, philanthropy, pension systems, all kinds of devices that need to be brought together. Uh, one example of uh, the, the need in the housing arena is the homeless. Uh, and Se Secretary Martinez spent a lot of time, as Pam indicated in his biographical notes, uh, on homelessness. We have in the audience Nan Roman, who heads the National Alliance to End Homelessness. They have a goal of ending chronic homelessness in the United States. Uh, but it has required creativity at the local level, beyond just the federal government. Uh, the truth of the matter is that in this recession, we managed to see a plateau in homelessness. Surprisingly, it didn't grow that much. But now that the pressures are on fiscally and the dollars are starting to decline, homelessness is starting to rise again. So it's an example of where if you don't have dollars on hand, you can't deal with some really pressing needs. And as someone told me when I, the, the, day, the day that I was sworn in as HUD secretary, your first obligation as the secretary of housing is to those Americans who are completely unhoused, the homeless. There's no one suffering more in this country other than maybe people who are sick than people who are homeless on the streets, and many of them are homeless and sick. So it's an example of where we, 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 we can't allow other things to be completely eliminated because they involve real people and real pain. Senator Bond, I think about you, and a lot of people look at you and say you've been very bipartisan in your career. You, you work with people on both sides of the aisle to build consensus. And maybe one of the most uh, important pieces of landmark housing legislation was the 49 Housing Act, also a product of bipartisanship. Uh, and in that, it sort of defined what the goal, the national goal or policy for housing was. 
do we need to revisit that? Do we need to fundamentally rethink what our national policy vis-a-vis -vis housing is? There's no question that the American housing system is broken. Uh, the, the, the families who are out of work and the, the communities, the country, and I think it is time for us to take a, an in-depth look at where we are going. If you don't know where you're going, you're sure to get there. And uh, at this point, we need to get see if we can develop a consensus. It has to be a bipartisan consensus. And uh, you mentioned uh, homelessness. And uh, this was a great opportunity with Nan Roman's guidance, uh, worked with uh, uh, ja uh, Senator Jack Reed, uh, my fellow uh, senators, uh, Barbara McCoskey and Patty Murray, and Wayne Allard on the Republican side, uh, to get a, a supportive homeless uh, program in place because the old wisdom of just providing shelter was not working. You have to have supportive services, caseworkers, and other appropriate services. Patty Murray and I carried that into uh, the uh, area of veterans homing, the VASH program. Uh, and that, that was done because the details, the details are so important, uh, it's almost easier to work across the aisle on those. And uh, when uh, Secretary Cisneros was in, and we were, Barbara Mikulski and I were working Hope Six, uh, we worked so closely uh, with Secretary Cisneros that I'm proud the Wall Street Journal in 96 called us the odd couple because we, we worked so closely together. But great partner, Mel Martinez was a great partner as well. And I had the honor of working with a few things under uh, Senator Mitchell's tutelage when I first got there. He explained it to me how the place worked. <laughs> Senator Mitchell, that last question here is you've been through a number of these initiatives uh, both in other roles in the Middle East and in Northern Ireland and your critical involvement in the bipartisan policy work. Uh, what, what have you learned from that that, that you are going to apply to this effort? Are there errors made in the past that you think we can avoid this time? What's the secret to success here? This is partial repetition of what I said before. Uh, I think in the United States today, uh, uh, the secret to success does not lie uh, in a single ideological point of view. Uh, this is a big country uh, with widely varying interests, uh, people from all over the world, uh, and uh, you have to have respect for the view of those with whom you disagree. If you begin with the premise that I'm always right and you're always wrong and you're not just wrong, you're evil or criminal or bad, uh, then you never get anywhere. Uh, and it's, an ev it's the country's largely or roughly evenly divided. We've seen that in the last few elections swinging uh, back and forth. And you can't get a, a practical, realistic solution to a major problem uh, that will be sustainable uh, unless it's bipartisan or unless there are extraordinary circumstances. And so I think that uh, on an issue like this, we can make a real contribution. Uh, perhaps even beyond that when we were in the position to cast votes and make statements because when you're not in public office, you're not subject to the same pressures as when you were. Uh, I recall one uh, prime minister of another country who campaigned one way and when we got in office, he, he uh, reversed himself and a reporter asked him about it and he said, well, he said, the world looks very different when you're sitting inside here looking out than it did when you're standing outside there looking in. And that's true also in this country. So maybe we can make a contribution, set forth something that people will find credible and from which they can draw inspiration maybe is too strong a word but at least some idea of how best to proceed. And I, I think that's the key. Respect for the other's point of view, uh, understanding the political context in which we live and operate. Please join me in thanking the four core chairmen of the Bipartisan Housing Center. Let, my, let me add a thanks to Rick. And now we have a little time for question and answer. Um, if uh, we could start with uh, Credentialed press who have any questions, and please let us know who you are. 
We'll go way in the back first. We have some mics running around. <coughs> Hi, uh, Adriana with Talk Radio News Service. I just wanted to ask, uh, you were talking about changing, the changing population and how that affects housing. And I was wondering what role do you think immigration reform would play in um, bettering the housing as far as undocumented immigrants who own homes and who are now facing deportation or simply fear staying in the country? Do you think immigration reform is an important part to the housing reform? Um. There are a number of different demographic forces that have great bearing on the housing situation. Obviously, one of them is the uh, changing makeup of the American population with respect to minorities, uh, who, many of whom are of lower income. If we're going to have a middle class in the future, th those people have to be provided education, um, wages, and the opportunity to go to the middle class which has always been an important backbone of American prosperity. And since the end of World War II, one of the vehicles by which we have built the middle class is home ownership. First, a decent place to live so people can get a platform as a renter, but then eventually the equity that is built up through home ownership for most Americans is some total of their net worth. So that's one dynamic is minority populations. Then you have aging, rapidly aging population. Uh, many people do not want the responsibility of a yard and a big house, and so that might be a fuel for renters. Uh, you correctly point out that immigrants are a part of this. I suspect that one of the really big surges in the, in the, in the market for housing going forward is going to be the immigrant population of all kinds. Hispanics from the South, Asians from, uh, the, from the Pacific Rim, uh, Eastern Europeans, people from the Middle East, uh, we're blessed in this country to have that rich infusion of workers and talent, and, and uh, uh, many of them uh, have completely believe in the American dream. Their definition of the American dream is home ownership, and there will be a, a big surge uh, of, of opportunity f to provide housing uh, from those populations. Uh, is immigration reform a part of the answer? Yes. Uh, we have a broken housing system, we also have a broken immigration system, and in due course uh, we will have to fix that. That's not the purview of this commission, uh, but, but on another front we will have to uh, fix that, and as we do, uh, that will be a source of, uh, of, of Americans, of citizens, uh, of, of workers and residents who need a place to live. So it's very much part of the housing equation. Ron? Uh, Ron Brownstein, National Journal. And the housing crisis has been with us for several years now. It really hasn't snuck up on anyone. And yet, I think if we polled in this room, almost no one would say that either President Obama or Republicans in Congress have put forward solutions that are commensurate with the scale of the problem. And here in 2012, the Republican presidential candidates are almost completely silent on it. I'm wondering why you think it has been so difficult for anyone to come forward with ideas several years into this crisis that are at scale of the challenge that we are facing and what you all have described as a human tragedy. I'll be glad to comment. Uh, uh, without either accepting or rejecting the premise at the heart of your question, uh, <laughs> no. I think that in his first question, Rick described the problem, which, direct, which is a direct response to your question. It's very difficult. There are competing forces, competing factors. It's never been easy. Uh, we've had series of national, nationally important legislative acts to try to deal with the problem. And as you know, uh, Ron, you follow the Congress uh, and uh, American politics very closely. Uh, when you're in office, you can only tackle so many things. Uh, uh, everybody who takes office has got uh, a, a whole range of items that are addressed in a campaign, but in terms of actually focusing and trying to solve a problem, you really do. If you don't establish very tight and narrowly focused priorities, you end up not getting anything done. So uh, I think our best approach is not to focus 
on that kind of issue, with all due respect to you, but rather on how do we get out of this? How do we come up with a solution to it? I've always said it's always important to be aware of your past, but not to be chained to it. And one of the reasons for the success of American society has been that more than most in history, it's been forward-looking. And I think that's what we have to be, forward-looking. How did we get here? Not who's to blame, but how can we help everybody work out of the problem? As Senator Mitchell said, it's a tough stump to jump because there are many issues, there are many parts of it. Uh, when you affect one, as I believe Henry said earlier, then it affects everything else. And this is a time when a series of small band-aids, and it'd be, if you're going to describe something on a campaign trail, you'd be fortunate to get the time and the attention and interest to put forth a band-aid. And they, some of them may do that. There may be little bits and pieces that are good, but little bits and pieces aren't going to get it done. This is, this is a major problem that's going to require uh, a systematic review and a construction of a set of policies that will deal with all of the different elements. And I think that's, that's what makes uh, this uh, challenge of the BPC so exciting and so challenging. My, my sense is that um, the problem was more intense and bigger and more complex than anyone understood of, of either side. Uh, an example is the, you know, the packaging up of uh, mortgages into securities and selling them into global markets. So when you try to deal with the problem at the local level, you can never find the chain of ownership of the mortgage, for example. That, didn't, that hasn't existed traditionally in American society. It was fueled by the scale of the technology that allowed uh, special investment vehicles and all kinds of things to make that happen. That's just one example of how complex this was. Um, so I think the administration, both President Bush in the latter part of his term and President Obama, you know, started down the path, but they had other fish to fry, as the senator said. There was the issue of the banks, how to, how to keep the banks from failing, and they mounted a major rescue, which is in some sense at odds with doing principal modifications on mortgages, because you're trying to save the banks. So lots of complexities that, 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 that make this so hard. Um, someone asked me the other day, I think it was a Bloomberg reporter, whether it's too late. Well, there's no such thing really as too late. We have a flat recovery. We don't have housing leading the recovery or participating in the recovery. So it's never too late. It may be late, but it's not too late. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, whatever contribution a group like this can make uh, is important, as, as Senator Bond said to the larger picture, not just individual pieces, but the, but the virtue of a group like this is it can take the larger picture, the non-political picture, and the, and the longer-term picture. A couple more questions. Yeah, right there. Josh Boak with Politico. It's been suggested that one of the reasons why uh, uh, ways to address the housing crisis have been delayed is that someone has to accept financial losses whether that be banks, governments, or homeowners. And I'm wondering how you intend to try to address that very thorny question in this commission. That's my view, That's my view too. I second that area of agreement. Area of agreement already, bipartisan. Thoroughly. Thoroughly. Players are absorbing losses now and will continue to absorb losses. I don't think that uh, we're going to recreate that reality. I think, in fact, uh, the banks, the mortgage companies, uh, homeowners, uh, everyone, uh, cities by the devaluation of home prices. And uh, so I think that's already being felt across the board. So I think what we need to do again is to look to the future and see how we, we can craft something that begins to pull this back together on a consensus sort of way. Anyone have a final uh, question? Yeah, in the, right here in front. Advisor Magazine, um, all of you have been involved in different reports and have seen different reports come out of different commissions over the years on tax reform, Millennial Housing Foundation, Social Security. A lot of these just ended up on shelves somewhere collecting dust. Nothing was ever done. It was mentioned, though, that this commission will be not only coming up with recommendations but also advocating for those recommendations. And I was wondering how will the members of the commission actually be advocating to 
so that these ideas have a good chance of getting enacted or adopted? Well, let me say that I, 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 it, it is a cliche of American life that uh, uh, all studies end up on shelves. And, and it is literally true that ultimately they do. But I think that overlooks the fact that often uh, they do have a profound impact. Believe it or not, members of Congress read uh, studies and analyses and listen to experts, and the vast majority of them try very hard to come up with what is the right solution. It, it isn't often that anybody will take a big 300-page report and say, this is it, I agree with everything, I'm going to put it in a bill. But it is much more frequent than, than commonly understood that an idea, a suggestion, some points, some part of a debate does inform decision making. So I, I don't, if I thought that there was no possibility of our having any impact on anyone, I, I wouldn't be here. It'd be a waste of time for all, all of our colleagues. So I, I, think, I think you have to look at it from the positive side. I, I, if, if, if we can present something that's realistic, practical, grounded in common sense, and strikes people as reasonable, I think it will have an effect. Senator, there's also the by part, I mean, there's also a philosophical dimension here, which is by definition, the bipartisan policy center searches very hard to get even Stephen balance on the commission with people who are respected uh, for their voice uh, uh, on the commission. And therefore, they have access. That's part of the formation of the commission itself, is to get people who, because of their background and their associations and their history, have access. And I watched this process unfold in this debt reduction commission where uh, Pete Domenici and Alice Rivlin are still, still evangelizing on how to do tax reform with the super committee now as a result of what that commission did. It's a great, a great you know, example of how it works. I would add two quick things as well. One is the calendar. The commission is going to report in the first quarter, I suppose, of 2013, which is a good time in the political calendar for there to be people who might be willing to listen. The second is, is the depth of the problem and the fact that this is a comprehensive approach to looking at it. I think you'll find uh, many ideas on the table about how to reform GSEs. Well, that's only one aspect of the problem. We're going to look at the entirety of it. Obviously, we'll have to have some boundaries. Uh, but I think a comprehensive review of it all uh, will also be enticing to policymakers because we'll have uh, a comprehensive prescription for what is probably fundamentally the biggest problem the American economy faces. I'm told we actually set the clocks ahead a few minutes, so we have a time for a final, final question. When that happens in the Senate at midnight, people would stand up and say, that only happens in the Senate. <laughs> I have a Please, we'll, we'll have short responses. Hi, Stacey Caper with National Journal. Just to follow up on the last uh, point Senator Martinez made about early 2013, oh, man, about 2013 being a good time, you know, the housing situation is um, at a critical point right now, and we're already pretty far into the next election cycle. Is there any chance you might try to break off something to deal with the immediate housing situation first and then come back with a more comprehensive plan for housing finance reform? Because by early next year, how, how much of an impact do you think you can make at that point and get something through? I would, I would take that one and say that uh, uh, right now, uh, we need to have a comprehensive solution that isn't going to be done. Uh, we're not going to come out with a Band-Aid uh, within uh, uh, just a couple of months because, as has been described, one Band-Aid here may cause a, a wound to open up someplace else. Uh, so no, that's why we're going to spend, uh, spend a year. And in addition, I don't think anybody's really mentioned it, but we are going to be listening around the country. We're going to do research, and we're going to have an opportunity to listen uh, to people who are knowledgeable in this. So it isn't just the, quote, wisdom, close quote, of the, whatever, the 18-member commissioner, or however member it, many it is in the final analysis. But we'll have their input, and uh, uh, we should be ready by 2013. And uh, my guess is, if the Senate is still like it was when I left, the chances uh, of them getting anything really significant done on housing in 2012 or somewhere between slim and none, uh, with the latter uh, likelihood being greater. <laughs>
Thank you again, everybody, and we look forward to uh, continuing to be in touch.